Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Alex Zago. I'm the Director of Programming at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. Um, today, we're going to take a look at Selling Lies, a new film by alumna Leslie Iwerks. And uh, this event is presented together with the USC School of Cinematic Arts and the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. Following the film, which we're going to play in its entirety, uh, it, the film runs about 32 minutes, uh, we'll have a panel discussion moderated by Jeffrey Cole, director of the Center for the Digital Future, uh, that will include director, producer, editor, Leslie Iwerks, line producer, Samir Lyuma, and Mike Anani from the USC Annenberg um, School of Communication and Journalism. When we uh, open the panel discussion for questions from the audience, please place your questions in the Q&A box that you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, from there, we'll call on people individually to uh, join us momentarily as, as a panelist so that you can turn your video on if you'd like, um, or at the very least for you to be able to use your microphone and then you can ask your question live. So I hope that you'll stick with us and I hope you enjoy the film. It runs again about 32 minutes and um, please join us for the panel discussion to follow. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Um, to get us started, I'd like to now invite the Dean of the USC School of Cinematic Arts, Elizabeth Daly, to just say a few words to um, welcome everyone for the panel. Get in here. Oh. Sorry, Alex, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry, I turned your video off for a moment. No, that's okay, I, just, I jumped off another Zoom meeting, so I was suddenly halfway in the wrong meeting anyway thank you and leslie thank you thank you so much for making this at what is just an unbelievably critical time for us to be able to have some window into the truth and i think what was so impressive to me and uh, i watched this a couple of times yesterday at home and i i just found what we love about great documentary is that the people speak for themselves. You don't have to make an argument. You don't have to argue about whether it happened or not. Here you have people saying, this is what we did. This is why we did it. And here's the impact it had on the American elections. And no matter what your political persuasions are, I think none of us want our elections tampered with. And you kind of ended the argument about whether or not it happened. And uh, besides the fact, like all your work is beautifully made. so. I, for one, feel extremely grateful to you for making this, and I just hope that it, we can help get it as widely seen as possible. And for everybody participating today, all 172 of you, please vote, vote. It's critical. And you know what I think Leslie makes so clear in this documentary is we have to take charge of our own fate as a country right now. Whatever you believe in, we've got to try to stand up for it and be counted so thanks a million leslie thanks for being here and for always being supportive of the school and the students really appreciate it and i'm looking forward to hearing the q a alex i'll hand it back to you thanks dean daly um i'd like to now invite up uh jeff cole the director of the center for the digital future in 2004 um jeffrey cole joined the US usc annenberg school for communication and journalism uh, as the director of the newly formed Center for the Digital Future and as a research professor. Prior to join, joining USC, Dr. Cole was a longtime member of the UCLA family and served as director of the UCLA Center for Communication Policy based in the Anderson Graduate School uh, of Management. Um, at UCLA and now at USC Annenberg, Cole founded and directs the World Internet Project, a long-term longitudinal look at the effects of computer and internet technology on all on all aspects of society, uh, which is conducted in over 20 countries. So Jeff is going to take over from here and welcome up the panelists. And, uh, and then I will come back when it's time for the audience questions. Take it away, Jeff. All right. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Dean Daly. You know, the USC Film School has so many remarkable students, but it must be so rewarding to watch one of your graduates make the piece we just saw. 
maybe we should take a moment and let everybody stand up and throw something having watched the 31 minutes of this movie. It is so infuriating. Uh, nonetheless, I've got so much I want to ask. I'm not the moderator because my schedule was free. I'm the moderator because I think this is truly a remarkable film and wanted to participate in a discussion with the director, the cinematographer, with a really distinguished academic. So let's get the introductions out of the way and get right into uh, the discussion. And let's start with the writer, producer, director. Leslie Iwerks is an Academy Award and Emmy nominated director and producer. She serves as the CEO and creative director of Iwerks and Company, a Santa Monica based multimedia production company. She creates critically acclaimed and award winning documentaries, features, and series that celebrate the genius, risks, and rewards of creative visionaries, and these guys were creative, uh, showcasing heartfelt human tales from the depths of the Guatemalan garbage dumps to the toxic tar stands of Alberta, Canada. An adventure and travel enthusiast, iWorks is filmed on all seven continents around the world. And somewhere in our discussion, Leslie, I want to know how you got to Antarctica. Her feature films, including uh, her feature films, include the Pixar story, Citizen Hearst, Industrial Light and Magic, The Hand Behind the Mouse, the of iWorks story, and most recently, the in-depth six-part docu-series which kicked off the Disney Plus channel, The Imagination, The Imagineering Story, which debuted in 2019. Her desire to innovate and push boundaries with her filmmaking has been cultivated and inspired by her family upbringing as her grandfather, Ub Iwerks, was the original designer and co-creator of Mickey Mouse. I've heard of him and a multi-academy award-winning visual effects pioneer. And her father, Don Iwerks, is also an Academy Award winner for technical lifetime achievement and the founder of the large format film company, Iwerks Entertainment, which has built Iwerks large format theaters and projection systems in over 200 theaters around the world. So let's welcome Leslie. Hi. Hi, Jeff. And just hold on for a moment. I just want to get all the paperwork done and then we can really, we don't have to get stuff. Sorry about Let's that. Let's get our second guest. Samar Yuma is an acclaimed cinematographer and producer. His focus is on capturing human behavior, intimate relations, and authentic interaction. He was the cinematographer on the double Oscar nominated feature documentary Honeyland, which won three main awards at the Sundance Film Festival. He's also contributed an inside perspective for the international productions of Fake News Fairy Tale by Kate Stonehill. Samir is the winner of the American Society of Cinematographers Award for Best Documentary Cinematography. The Imago Award, IDA Award, Cinema Eye Honors Award, Sundance Special Jury Award for Best Cinematography. Samir? Oh, you, you can get it. Welcome. And just hold on one more minute, and we're almost there. Okay. And our Thanks third for the invitation. And our third and final guest is Mike Anany, who's an Associate Professor of Communications and Journalism at the USC Annenberg School. He studies the public significance of digital news infrastructure and the politics of algorithm system, algorithmic systems. He's been very busy. He's the author of numerous articles in the book, Network Press Freedom, co-editor of the volume, Bauhaus Futures, and is preparing a manuscript on the public power of silence. He holds a PhD from Stanford University, I've heard of that too, a master's from the MIT Media Laboratory, 
and he's written for popular press publications, including The Atlantic, Wired Magazine, and the Columbia Journalism Review. So Mike, if you will unmask yourself. <laughs> Great to be here, Jeff. Thanks very much. All right, so thank you, all of you. Let's get started. Leslie, um, I really do think it was a brilliant film. I, I'd like to know a little bit about the decision to make it 30 minutes. I've seen so many other things on this topic, including the social dilemma that was 90. I think you did more in 30 and made it more accessible. As I said, this film was infuriating. As an American, I find it incomprehensible that the dilemma our country is in may have gotten us there by a bunch of guys in Veles, Macedonia, who really just wanted to make money and started to do so by promoting health, but found that politics was more lucrative. So let's start with how did the idea to go there to make this movie, what was the process of getting it put together and who finances a movie like this? Well, uh, I financed it myself. So let's start there. Um, I woke up on a Sunday morning um, after the election and I read this article in Wired Magazine about these teenagers in Macedonia who were doing creating all these fake news sites. And I just thought this would be a, a, a powerful film. And I was re started reading up on it and all these other articles about it. And I just felt like they weren't going deep enough. The stories were all kind of repetitive. They were all covering the same things. And I thought this would be a, an interesting film to go make. So uh, cut to about a month later, I'm having lunch with my, my cameraman, longtime cameraman, Suki Medenchevic. And I said, Suki, I'd love to go do this film. Would you want to do it with me? And he said, well, I would, because I, he's from Bosnia. So he was going to be in Bosnia over the summer. And he says, if you fly to Macedonia, I'll come meet you and we'll go spend like a week or two filming this and, you know, let's just do it. And so that's what we did, you know. So cut to Suki, uh, you know, finds some folks in, in Macedonia that can help. And then they lead us to Samir here, who ended up being um, our one of our cameramen and also was along with Suki and also our line producer. And so Samir and I uh, and Suki, we get on these Zoom calls and start prepping the film in advance. And he then kind of was our sort of laid the groundwork prior to, to me and Suki and I getting there. And, um, you know, you know, is starting to interview all these folks. So, so then we started doing interviews over Zoom and, and then started prepping the film from, from America. And then pretty soon I was on a plane to Macedonia and landed there and met with Samir and Suki who became fast friends. All of us became fast friends. And Samir ends up becoming like the greatest uh, DP of the, of the last year with Honeyland. So he got to see him come to the States and, uh, get an Oscar nomination for that film. And um, anyway, it's just been a really interesting ride. So that's kind of how it started. And in the introduction, I mentioned so many of, of your films, which are six hours or longer. Uh, you must have had 10 hours sitting on the cutting room floor with this. What was the thought in getting it down to 31 minutes? Was it making it easier to be seen on television? As I mentioned, the social dilemma went for 90 minutes. What was the process, the thought process behind 31? Well, I just felt that short, I love making short films. They're sort of my passion project. I love to, I've often funded my own shorts and I find that those are my um, kind of, I don't know, uh, social issue docs that I find that can pack a punch. Um, I've been nominated and shortlisted for all of my shorts, except for this one actually, but um, that, so and I found that they can create a lot of awareness in a short amount of time. And they've actually gone on to raise money for events and millions of dollars, um, one of my shorts uh, for, for raising money for good causes. So I, I feel like that's kind of a sweet spot for me if I can do it in a short, in a short way. It'll just kind of give you a taste of what, what, more is out there and then hopefully people will see this and they'll you know go out and do research and 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 try to help and um you know be almost like a call to action uh so that's that was the reason 
And Samir, you were the guy on the ground in Veles. How did you find these people? They seem to have alternating impulses. On the one hand, you don't talk about this stuff. It gives the game away. On the other, they had an amazing story and seemed to want to brag about it. The, the, the husband talking about his wife's work was saying with a great smile, it's completely made up. We almost felt bad for him when Facebook shut him down and took all his money away. Almost felt bad. How did you get these people to talk on camera? In some senses, they're international pariahs. Uh, it was not easy, I will say. Uh, so uh, prior to the project with Leslie, uh, I had a chance to meet most of the players uh, working on one student project with uh, another director uh, on very short uh, documentary on this topic. Um, but um, it was very short time, not too much uh, uh, chance to meet all these people, but it was a good kind of preparation uh, when Leslie came. So I had enough time to meet enough people, to get the story, to get involved and to understand actually what they're, they're doing uh, and to, to kind of uh, manage to bring some of the people and of course i mean macedonia is really small country so um, you just recall some of your friends from villas when uh, you meet uh, through the live and ask and everybody basically knew or they were uh, personally involved uh, in this golden uh, kind of time when everybody wanted uh, to try in this particular uh, town to build some uh, portal, web portal, where they can make easy money. Um, I, I mentioned that you could see their pride and they really did do something remarkable to be sitting, even Tucker Carlson tried to use, you know, make fun of Hillary that how could Macedonia affect the presidential election? Did you come across any guilt? Is there yes. anyone who said uh, yes. they shouldn't? Yes, uh, for sure. Uh, but again, uh, before this uh, topic get out in the media, they didn't feel any guilt because uh, we are such a small country and uh, the people who were doing this, they never thought that they could ever influence the democracy of one of the biggest uh, uh, states, uh, you know, in the world. Uh, such as United States, so they didn't even thought that they what with the action they're doing they could influence. So for them it was just easy way how they can make money uh, out of uh, in their home comfort, working uh, from home and uh, trying to build stories, which they were sometimes uh, making up uh, during the coffee and laughing about the titles because. Uh, they didn't even believe that there will be somebody who will take it for granted and they will influence uh, their opinion. And, and the only guy in the film I think we saw who had any legitimate or serious political convictions was the one who called himself a libertarian and liked to Ted Cruz. Right. And I assume you can reassure us that all of these people have found good jobs and are nowhere near social media before the 2020 presidential election, correct? <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, I really don't know, uh, but um, I think that uh, now um, uh, 2020 elections are not only main topic uh, which uh, raise the interest of uh, the entire world, but they have now another topic uh, which is uh, COVID-19 uh, which also, if they're doing the same thing, uh, can make uh, them easy money uh, with all these conspiracies uh, and uh, theories uh, about or against uh, the existence of the virus, uh, which uh, it's also much on the spotlight as much as uh, the elections 2020 in the United States. I was afraid you were going to say that. And Mike, was there anything in here that's news to Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook? 
did they would they have learned anything from this a year ago? I mean, according to <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, Mike. No, yeah. go ahead, go ahead, go no, for I it. I mean, well, why don't you Mike start, Mike? Uh, and he from, can Samir uh, can join in. The, but Mike, why don't you start with that? Yeah. Uh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, no, so I don't. I don't think any of this is necessarily news to to Zuckerberg and Facebook in the sense that they um, have teams of people who are tasked with trying to identify signals across Facebook that may be uh, out of the ordinary, that may be sort of fueling different kinds of of mis disinformation. But I would say, it, while it's not news to them today. Um, in 2020, I think the scenes and the activity that the film depicted were not on Facebook's radar in the way they should have been in 2016 and 2017. And that Facebook, it was only after the election of Donald Trump that Facebook was taken to task uh, rather publicly by a set of journalists, by political operatives, various other uh, public groups. And that Mark Zuckerberg for a long time said, oh no, this was a small, uh, incident. This was not something that was, you know, heavily influenced the election. Um, and he had to be sort of dragged into a realization that Facebook had a problem. So I think what the film depicts, um, we look back on now and say, oh, you know, we, we should have understood that. We should have known with this. Um, but at the time, I think what we see is the social media companies and folks like Zuckerberg or Dorsey um, not really understanding the power that they had to shape elections and public discourse in this way they were very focused on making advertising revenue and making money off the engagements and the and the the types of engagements that the film depicts um but i think we've seen the platforms be sort of slow to recognize their power in this realm in the way that the film shows and facebook says it shut down thousands of sites it's all over this window dress first of all do they even mean it and if so, is it real reform or is it cosmetic? And if it is cosmetic, what, what could they do? Or is that hopeless? Well, so I think usually the, the Occam's razor, sort of the simplest approach to some of these things is rarely is it sort of an insidious, you know, conspiracy by Facebook to, you know, concertedly ignore these things. Often I think they were really slow to develop the kind of competency and literacy that they needed to address this problem. So they've spent a long time trying to figure out how to even identify these groups. And the reason they've spent a long time, I think, to do this is Facebook wants to do everything at scale. It wants to do things algorithmically. It's not interested in the kind of small scale sort of artisanal getting to know the kinds of people and communities you know that the, that the film depicts and that Leslie was researching. Um, Facebook, they want an algorithm. They want a computational algorithm that will fix this problem. So I think that's what they're searching after. They're looking for a single, single approach that can also work worldwide. They have a hard time dealing with local languages. There's many of their automatic detection tools do not work in many of the world's languages. So they're, they're blind to many of those types of um, misinformation processes that are happening all over the world. And they're, they're sort of building this infrastructure of moderation as they're forced to. So I think films like this, the work of investigative journalists and documentary filmmakers, what we know is that it's that these people are constantly dragging Facebook into a position of accountability. And I think we need to keep doing that kind of accountability work um, of the type that the film books. And if only life could be run by an algorithm. One last question to you, Mike. Uh, can we do, can we teach people, you're a professor, can you teach your students the skills? Can we teach the average citizens the skills to know, you know, it was 2005, Stephen Colbert coined the term truthiness. It was Kelly Conway, Kelly and Conway, who gave us alternative facts. Can we teach people how to be critical consumers? Um, sure. And I think that there's, there's no one single silver bullet to this. So I think a critical media literacy is a key part of what we need to do so that people ask questions and pause before they, they look at something. Um, I think that's always a, a noble goal, is that sort of literacy. Um, my concern about that approach or foregrounding or almost making that the exclusive approach is it puts us back into the situation where it's your fault if you're living in a society where this misinformation is circulating. It's your fault if you haven't followed up and fact checked. It's your fault if you shared the wrong thing. And we know that the platforms and the algorithmic systems that they make have a ton of power 
to make certain kinds of moves more likely to suggest things to us. And it's so I think it's while it's a noble and good goal to develop literacy around some of these things, um, that's a lot to put on individuals. And my worry is that when we devolve this or sort of uh, fragment this to the problem of what individuals should be doing and we blame individuals, we take the heat, we take the pressure off the platforms, the tech companies, the media companies that have a ton of power to sort of create the conditions that will make you share something or not share something. So I, think that's a, I think that's a powerful point and we should look to others to protect us as consumers, but we have to live in a world of caveat emptor let the buyer beware. One last question for Leslie and Samir, and then let's open it up to the audience. Leslie, you obviously were completely committed to this. I didn't realize you financed it yourself. There's no greater commitment. What was the plan? What is the plan? Maybe this event is part of that. To transfer, or translate this document into something that might have an impact both before the 2020 election and after? What is the process of trying to get this seen and to change people's minds or inform them? Well, the, the intent to make, to, in making this film was really to go and find the truth and to let the players speak for themselves. Um, I think one of the hardest things for me as a filmmaker um, is, you know, obviously I, I always have my opinions and I have my angle that I'm sort of, you know, taking. And in this case, of course I had my angle, but I had to really pull back and let Trache speak for himself. Um, I think he was very concerned about me flying all the way over there and then attacking him, you know, and making him out to be the bad guy. And that was not my intent. My intent was to just be a fact, uh, you know, a fact checker and to record the truth and then ultimately let the the audience decide how they feel about it. I mean, there's nothing you can dispute in this film about what happened because they're telling you what they did, right? So um, my goal was really to just, you know, make, make the audience mad about how this is going down, what's going on in other parts of the world and it's what's going on in our own country, what's going on with Russia. I mean, this is just, as we said at the beginning of the film, this is just one story, right? Um, but it is happening again now. There's more websites coming out of Macedonia as we speak. Um, they're largely moving over to a right-wing um, social media site called, called Parler, which uh, they call the, um, kind of the, the free speech um, network. Uh, so, you know, if it's not Facebook where they're putting restrictions on, on these folks, then they're gonna go to another one and they're gonna build their own network and it's, and it's happening quickly. A lot quicker. Is, is there a process from when the last frame was edited and it was complete to when the world is fixed, how you take the film and try to, is it getting it in universities? Is it? Yeah. And what's the process that has an in, that can have this have an influence? So we um, we didn't release the, we released the film throughout um, you know in festivals over the last year and a half and it's won a bunch of awards and so we just recently got it on iTunes it's going to kind of be up on Amazon soon it's on Vimeo on, on demand um, Shorts TV kind of picked it up and they're running with it and trying to get it out uh, internationally um, through the distribution channels. And the, the goal for me really, it wasn't about anything other than just making a story, telling a story that needed to be told, that people need to see and take you into this world in a way that's, that's you know, informative, enlightening, slightly entertaining, hopefully, um, but, but emotional too. And then now take it and do something with it. So I wanna inspire young students to try to get off of reading their news from social media. Um, you know, I, I want to try to illuminate people to to ch fact check their sources, to try to um, just stay away from sharing fake news or sharing information they don't know is true. I mean, this is our responsibility, I think, uh, as, as much as it is Facebook's responsibility and Twitter and Twitter's, you know, doing, I think, stepping up to the plate by removing certain sites um, very quickly now. And um, 
So I think that the social media companies are definitely stepping up, but I, I know there's a, lot, a, a long way to go. Um, and so I just hope this film can get out. I hope people will share it. I hope people will go to our website, sellinglivesdoc.com and, and download the film and share it with your friends and family. And um, you know, there was so much fake news going on in our election, ahead of our election right now. This is such a critical time to just kind of be aware of what's happening. And Samir, just the same question, and then we'll get right to the audience. Has this film been screened or seen in Macedonia? And are the act, not the actors, but the people portrayed in the film, are they now celebrities asked to pose for selfies? Uh, well, uh, it was screened uh, last year on the festival, investigative uh, journalist uh, festival. Uh, and uh, I mean, they become famous uh, because um, uh, there were also other journalists who were writing about it, uh, about them, uh, but uh, uh, they, they are not very proud of what they did. Uh, so, or they started hiding uh, and uh, trying to be as much as low profile as possible. Uh, so, I don't know if they feel as uh, as a stars, to be honest. Uh, well, for one, uh, for sure I can say it's uh, the guy who taught them. He's uh, still uh, teaching uh, people to use uh, uh, online uh, media for uh, uh, making money, how to make money. So he's following all the trends. Uh, he told me that it's much more difficult now after uh, the Facebook and Twitter introduced this crackdown on misinformation, uh, but they find the new platforms and new way how to continue with spreading their content, uh, no matter what is the content. Is it a politics or a healthy food or whatever? Samir, I just have to tell you that um, the other night, Mirko put the film on YouTube. <laughs> without my permission. Oh. <laughs> so I immediately emailed, I said, Mirko, that's copyright infringement. You're not supposed to be doing this. And he's like, okay, I'll take it down. I just wanted to show some friends. And I thought, how in the world did he do that? Well, of course, it's Mirko, it's Macedonia, you know? Yeah. But yeah, anyway, it's it's LA. LA. I just I thought, how funny of all people, Mirko, really? <laughs> okay, so we have time for some questions from the audience. There's some in chat. I'm not sure if we can unmask the audience. So. Alex, can we? Or should I just read the questions? No, 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 we absolutely can. But I'm going to have to call on people individually to move them over. So All right. um, Why don't, I mean, I'm looking at the questions. Why don't we start with Gary Freeman, if that's OK? Absolutely. Gary, I'm going to move you over to the panel section. And Gary is muted. I'll give him a second, otherwise I'll ask his question. Um, I don't know if Gary knows he's muted. Well, then let's, okay, Gary's asking, and he would be very proud if you could see his face as his question was asked. Gary's asking, when researching, while researching this film and since then, have, oh, it just disappeared on me, sorry about that. Oh, um, I'm so sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, there, it should pop back up. Okay, yes. While researching this film and since then, have you found many fake news sites and sources other than in Macedonia? And I think that's a question that could apply to all three of you, or any of you. Maybe Mike, you should start with that. With um, For sure, I mean, I think the one of the big things that we're seeing is actually more in the US is more a domestic source for a lot of mis and disinformation sites, so there's, um, you know, there was a New York Times um, uh, sort of expose relying on some work that was done at Columbia Journalism School talking about how there's a healthy, well, I shouldn't say healthy, but a large and, and active ecosystem within the United States right now that's using uh, the appearance of local news organizations to look like authentic journalistic and news organizations, but that are actually funded by operatives of different kinds, often sort of Republican or right-wing operatives. And their aim is to look like news organizations. And one of those aims is not only just to sort of confuse people and to try to trick them into thinking that these are legitimate news organizations, but also to try to trick platforms into thinking that these are not sources of mis or disinformation, that these are real news organizations. And they're 
they're even hiring American journalists who are unfortunately, you know, out of work at a at a rate that is is rapidly increasing. So you have this confluence of a sort of uh, attack or collapse on the American journalism economic model at the same time that you have operatives trying to figure out new places, new ways to sort of do this mis and disinformation. So they're reinventing themselves as local news organizations that have names like the ones we would be familiar with. And that's becoming a very sort of increasingly robust and difficult place to detect, to police. Um, I, I almost, I was, as I was reading this, the, the article yesterday, I was thinking maybe this is Leslie's next film is to look at sort of the, the takeover of local news organizations in the US and this, the, the construction of local news as a myth. All right. Uh, why don't we go to an incident when, when somebody finishes, if anybody else wants to chime in, just do so. But why don't we move to Atif Malik and hope maybe Atif will be able to ask the question. Sure thing, I'm, I'm moving him over now. All right. And that's, that's muted also. Uh, well, that, that will take a moment because okay. we'll have to sort of adjust. We'll, we'll give him a second. Uh, Atif, maybe? if you want to join us, we are ready for you. All right. Um, well, then I will ask Atif's question. How, uh, how do we know that the Facebooks, Twitters, et cetera, who have the power to regulate what gets seen and what doesn't, don't have a political bias of their own and aren't removing what works in their best interest as opposed to what is actually just fake? Well, I would say that, um, you know, Facebook's whole business model is based on um, algorithms and and as many hits that it can get, clickbait is, is a volume um, super spreader for them and that creates ad revenue. And so the more money they can make, the better. Um, the more, I think, impositions that they put or restrictions they put on the fake news is out there will obviously uh, curtail the money that they can make. So that's my suspicion of Facebook. Um, you know, I've wondered the same thing because honestly, they've let so much right wing uh, material get on their platform and haven't curtailed it. Um, you have to wonder, do they have an agenda? But, you know, Mike can speak to that. I, I'd like to think they don't. Um, but, uh, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's all about making money. And that's, that's the sad thing. At the expense of our society, expense of our democracy, at the expense of, um, you know, uh, just truth and, and, and integrity in journalism. I, I would echo that and also um, just to say that I think the imperative to sort of earn the revenue is coming exactly in that form of engagement that, that Leslie's talking about. And so we're, if there's anything that's approaching a, a bias, it's not, it's not an overt sort of thing where you know, Mark Zuckerberg is necessarily coming in and saying, I want to amplify right-wing sources. But what often happens, he, he may do, do that in sort of idiosyncratic cases, but mostly what it is is that, uh, and this is work that's come out of Harvard recently, um, right-wing content uh, tends to have this higher quality of, quote, engagement that Facebook selects on. So it's not necessarily a concerted um, sort of active political bias, but the bias is baked into what the algorithm values and what the algorithm wants to, to amplify. So that's where I would look to the bias is, is to sort of the design of those systems. Right. All right, someone asked a question and I hit the wrong button and it seemed to disappear, but I think it's a great question. Is there a link here between what we saw in Macedonia and the emergence of QAnon and what QAnon is becoming? Well, do you want to take that one, Mike? Um, I, I, sure, I could. I mean, I think the, for me, the, the thread that we see between those two is and it's sort of this very, um, in some ways, it's a very American phenomenon. It's sort of this often called this weaponization of free speech, which is essentially to say um, all of these systems are sort of predicated on more individual expression is better. And also this idea that we never really know what the truth is. And I, so when I see, think of the work that we saw in the film and I think of QAnon, a lot of that preys on an idea that um, we don't know how things are. The world is too complicated. It's 
uh, who's to say what's true? We should let the people decide. There's all this sort of, I think, retreat from these spaces in which American media especially has actually come in with sort of expertise and uh, moments of saying, no, no, I've researched this and I'm willing to say this is the way things are. What happens in sort of a, a participatory space like a social media platform is where lots of people have a voice, it becomes, uh, confusion becomes the currency. Confusion becomes the thing that the platforms feed on. And I, so I see that sort of uh, nurturing and inculcation of confusion in audiences as the thing that is almost the common thread among all these spaces of mis and disinformation. Because somebody comes along and says, you might think that, but I've got some other person who's gonna say something different. And then in the end, we're just gonna put our hands up and say, who knows what's true or not. So it's, it's that, that confusion I think people play on. You know, the one thing that um, I was reminded of just recently was um, about the, what the Nazis did in the 30s was they used the phrase Lugan press, mm -hmm. um, you know, which was translated to fake press to undermine public support of the mainstream media. And, you know, obviously the same tools now being used by, by Trump with the fake news that he sort of uh, took and um, is now legit delegitimizing the mainstream press is calling them out as fake news and the enemy of the people. So it's the same tactic. Mm -hmm. I, and I think you saw that in the recent town hall where the moderator said to, to Trump, well, why are you saying masks don't work for the COVID? And he said, well, some people say masks work and some people say masks don't work and who's to know and how you're not a scientist. So it's that feeding on, on chaos. ambiguity, chaos, confusion. Yeah. Right. Uh, so many of the comments are say, raving about what an amazing film this is. How can they get a copy to show their students and just wanted to, I'll make sure Leslie and Samir, we save those comments rather than reading all of them. But iTunes. A <laughs> but a question from, and iTunes is a great answer. Question from Benjamin Goldhagen. Why don't we, Alex, give it one more try? If yeah, we... actually, uh, Jeff, could I suggest that you give me three names and that way I can have them all lined all up? Right. Why don't we try Cause... Benjamin Goldhagen? Let's do uh, Janice Engel. And uh, these are all congratulations, which should be heard, but. Uh, and let's do Daniel Webster. Perfect. Well, let's start, if we can, with Benjamin Goldhagen. And I, we see him. Hi. All right. Uh, first of all, great film. And uh, I know it takes a lot of guts to go into a place where you, may not, you don't know how people are going to respond to you and ask these kinds of questions. Um, the question I have for you is that this is, it seems to me that right now we're going through something of a golden age of documentary filmmaking. Um, that it's now having a great influence on the public. Uh, I, I have two children, or actually they're SC students, and they tell me all the time, see this film, see this film. The documentaries are informing them in a way that my generation really didn't have the exposure because you had to go to a movie theater like, or see it on PBS, like Frederick Wiseman's films. So how do you see documentary filmmaking now? And how do you think it's changing and with the different formats and the different audiences into the future? That's a great question. Um, I think we are definitely in a golden age of documentaries. It's a dream come true for me. When I started out doing documentaries, you know, it, the reality, reality, reality TV shows were the thing and everyone was watching reality TV and I thought, oh my God, you know, if this is where we're getting, you know, so much of our entertainment and whatnot and, you know, people, people kind of didn't really take documentaries, you know, that seriously. And um, now, you know, if you say you're a documentary filmmaker, everybody's like, wow, that's so cool. <laughs> and so, um, you know, to me, I've, I got into documentaries kind of by accident. I told my, the story of my grandfather and then that film did really well. And then it just kind of led from one project to the other, to the other. And I've, and I just feel there's a responsibility as a filmmaker, as a documentary filmmaker to, really tell the truth and try to get down and nail down as, as deep as you can into um, a subject and take that material and then bring it back up to the surface and hand it to an audience on a plate that is, that is um, you know, refreshing, that is, that is new, that is informative, and, and let you take that in in a way that maybe the news, newscast can't do. We, we tend to go deeper. 
you know, and that is exactly why I wanted to go to Macedonia because so many people that I interviewed were like, well, you're really asking these deep questions and no one, none of the journalists that came in from different places, they just wanted like 10 minutes of my time. They wanted the news bite and they left. So for me, I, I think I did, you know, Samir and I in, in Suki, we got a lot of respect for really wanting to spend time with everybody and really get behind what they were doing and what was keeping them ticking and, you know, what was, what was motivating them, right? Um, and so to me, that's the joy of documentaries. And I just think that with all the news, I mean, the streaming networks now that are looking for documentaries and are wanting to fund uh, to great, with great budgets, uh, I feel like we are in a way um, stepping up to the plate alongside the best journalists out there um, at a time when, when journalism is, is getting hit hard. And so that's what motivates me is I want to, I want to, I have a passion for journalism and for, for, free, for integrity in journalism. And so um, that's just something, this is something that's important to me, this subject, and that's why I told it. Right. Can I just follow up? Uh, Quickly, I think, please. I think what you just mentioned to me is something, a new concept to me, is that with newsrooms really closing investigative journalism, it's, it's not being funded. I, it, it seems to me what you just said is, is actually really crucial, that, that documentary filmmaking is now our investigative journalism. Yeah, and there's so many good docs out there, you know. The Social Dilemma being one of them, I'm really a big fan of that film. If anyone hasn't seen it, go, go watch it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Benjamin. Janice Engel, if you, I don't know if you had a chance to see. Oh, sorry, Samir, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I agree uh, that uh, really documentary is in the golden age. And I will uh, just tell you what was also my motivation to, uh, when, when this story came out uh, and when I show interest about uh, all these fake news factories in my country, um, I was also approached by other journalists uh, from uh, many mainstream media uh, around the world but uh, it was like kind of uh, my inner uh, feeling that uh, I would not uh, be able to work uh, with journalists even though I spent uh, nine years uh, in the media uh, so I think that um, as Les also mentioned that uh, now the journalism is really heated because um, probably, uh, and maybe it's because of uh, uh, the amount of um, access of the news uh, that everyone has, and um, we become some, some kind of uh, one-liners readers. We just are hitting the titles and uh, all the media outlets are becoming more and more involved into uh, what we should uh, put as a title and not about the content and the uh, the entire story and the documentaries are vice versa they are really going deep into uh, the real story so uh, probably um, and I hope that uh, it will keep doing this uh, that one, once in the in the past the journalists were uh, in the uh, in the position like documentaries uh, at the moment but I hope that the documentaries will keep the good work uh, as they're doing now Thank you, Samir. And we'll try to take the last two questions that we've lined up. We'll start with Janice Engel. Janice, I think you're muted and need to uh, unmute. Yeah. Hi there. Great, fantastic film. I just watched The Social Dilemma and made my students watch it last week. I, do, I teach documentary film and I'm also a documentary filmmaker. I made Raise Hell the Life and Times of Molly Ivins. So this uh, subject matter is it is uh, been happening for a while, and you what you did and got in and found out it's it's so infuriating, the arrogance, mm -hmm. not not particularly of this of the high school students because I get it, they're going to make more money, and of course that's the root of the rot. So, um, is there any talk? And I don't know if you guys know, but I mean, it, there's got to be regulation. It's systemic, and it really lies at the feet of Facebook, Google, Twitter. They're starting to wake up, but it's, it's clicks for cash, and that's systemic. How can, I mean, obviously it's education. I think your film needs to go to, it should be seen by every high school and university level student, and I'm talking globally, because they are always like this. 
Exactly. So first of all, bravo, brava, it's fantastic. And the more eyes on it, the better. But is there anything, is there anything, I mean, we hear, we see Zuckerberg and Dorsey in, in front of, you know, we, we have this four years of insanity. We hope that there's going to be change. Um, I don't know how the rest of the audience feels, but I would say that the majority of us hope there's going to be change for the better. Um, is there anything afoot for um, regulation that the possibility of clicks for cash, it's just insanity? Mike, that would seem to go sure. to you. Yeah, I can step in and I think, um, you know, I actually think this is where I think the social dilemma didn't go far enough at all, actually. And I think it would be fun to have a panel on, on that film because I think it actually, in a lot of ways, there's some missed opportunities there. Um, I would say that the, um, there is a healthy conversation around regulation. That conversation is not happening in the U.S. nearly as much as it needs to be. Um, jurisdictions uh, like Europe and Germany in particular are light years ahead of the U.S. in thinking about public regulation and thinking about public goods in general. So one approach is to do um, Social media companies in general do not want to have jurisdiction specific kinds of rules because that interrupts a scale imperative that underlies most tech companies in this space. You don't want to behave differently in Germany or in France or in the US or in Canada, in Australia, New Zealand. You want a single approach that's going to work for the entire platform. So there's a um, often a resistance to that regulation, but also a desire of saying, yes, if you're going to regulate us, I want one rule. That's what a Zuckerberg or a Dorsey would say. I don't want all these national governments doing it. Where I do think, though, there is actually some um, sort of some promise. One, I would look to, you know, the California Consumer Privacy Act, which is this, this if there's a prop about it, even this, uh, this election. But those are moments where instead of um, telling platform companies what they can or can't do is actually shift the conversation into where are data going? How are data being um, commodified, being personalized? Because a lot of the social media platforms really function on this ability to micro and personalize target uh, you. If I, if I know a lot about you, I can sell your eyeballs to a very particular advertiser. And the more I can do that in a really targeted way, the more I can charge for that access. So what if you undercut the personalization and the micro-targeting, then you sort of take out from under the platforms their, the power that they have to pocket up audiences in very really particular, narrow, targeted ways. That's the bread and butter of the platform companies, is that ability to personalize and micro-target. Um, so that's where I think we're, we're at the very beginnings of starting to see that regulation. Although there's a lot of noise about saying break up the tech companies entirely. In a lot of ways, I think that that's, that feels good to say, but it's actually highly unworkable in some sort of technical ways that, that won't get us. That, okay. that's, an, that's, an old, that's an old school model. I totally, I totally get that. But one size does not fit all. So Zuckerberg's whole thing that he wants one algorithm that'll take care of the, you know, the whole thing just seems so, um, yes, it's kind of simple, but then if you look at the social dilemma, they, they, they don't even know, the algorithms are, have, are, have gone even beyond what they know that they're, in a sense, what they're doing, what they're programming. Right. They're taking Let's all try, thank, you, thank you. Let's try to slide one more question in before thank we you. wrap it up. Uh, Daniel Webster, we see you. Can you can you, hear me. Yes, uh, we can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me. So uh, full disclosure, I know Leslie, so um, just being journalistically solid here. Uh, and just to pick up where Mike left off, uh, and this is a phenomenally good sort of dis discussion, you know, having a healthy uh, conversation around regulations is where I was sort of going, because uh, tech, tech companies are really becoming media companies, and uh, perhaps we need to sort of look at Section 230 of the uh, Communications Act, uh, you know, and there's a lot of danger in that because, in many ways, you could claim that it was that that section of the 26 words that created the internet, but it certainly needs to be explored, and uh, also the uh, reference to data. Um, I'll just sort of. Uh, draw people's attention to a phenomenally good book called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, uh, which goes very deep into this whole sort of uh, subject. 
Uh, but yeah, a um, bunch of questions. Um, I also endorse Mike's idea as a recovering former news television news director, uh, looking at the consolidation there and where people get uh, the majority of their news from, not just uh, in social media, but also uh, through uh, institutions which are supposedly serving in the public interest is uh, another good area of exploration. Is there a question in all that? A uh, good question. Um, uh, fundamental business models, a phenomenal documentary, Leslie. Uh, I actually loved the 31 minute uh, I format. Hate to bless I think you, that but it stimulates the conversation. Get to the I'm done. Okay. okay. Uh, question. Uh, Any re 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 uh, reforming, reforming the uh, reforming section 230, which Trump Any has takers. called for as well. Uh, yes, it, hence the risk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can jump in real fast and say honestly, I, I don't think that's an easy answer. If if, if 230 were repealed entirely, I don't think we buy ourselves some magic bullet solution in the same because 230 actually makes a lot of space for tech companies to do the kind of moderation that they're doing. But what it does not do is it does not hold them to account of any standard of moderation. It doesn't say, here's what you should be moderating in your interests of. It says you are free to come up with your own systems of moderation and values of moderation. So I don't think we need to get rid of 230, but we need to sort of frame 230 in a much better way. It's not a 230 issue. I think it's more of a public accountability issue. All right, thank you. It's as so let's wrap this up. I we really could, and it's not just nice words to say. We really could go for another hour, and we should in a different format. But uh, uh, it's one thing, Leslie and Samir, to sit in your chair and complain and say somebody ought to do something. It's another to fly to Macedonia, use your own money make a document and really get it in front of something. And for that, just we can only say bravo and wonderful and a great piece of filmmaking came out of it as well. John Parkland has said that he's already bought a copy of it on iTunes. I urge everybody to get a copy. Try to show it to your crazy uncle at Thanksgiving if you can. I don't know if your crazy uncle will watch it but maybe he will or your crazy aunt or grandmother. There are a lot of uh, professors in the audience. I suspect Leslie and Samir, you're gonna get invited into a lot of classes. There's a lot of students online, Mike. I suspect you're gonna see the enrollments in your class shoot up and I wish you had been my professor. So thank you everyone for, for making the movie and for being part of a great discussion. And I'm thrilled that it's recorded and we've created another document. Thank you, well, everybody. Thank you, Jeffrey, for moderating. You're uh, brilliant at what you do. And uh, the man who knows about disruption probably more than anybody. And um, I wanna thank Dean Daly and Dean Willow Bay for uh, offering to co-host this, this talk and this screening today. And for all the students out there, please spread the word and please just do your best to uh, counteract fake news and make this world a smarter place. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Right, I hope everyone stays safe and well. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.